Today we're joined by Ingrid Anderson, an environmental compliance specialist with facilities management and utilities and energy management at the University of Iowa. In addition to several campus environmental compliance programs, she's heavily involved in the UI, uh, U of I's biomass partnership program. Ingrid is a, a 2011 graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law, and she received her BS from the University of Iowa in 2005. Ingrid previously worked on the Biomass Partnership Project and other sustainability initiatives with the University of Iowa Office of Sustainability. As a licensed attorney in Iowa, she also interned with Plains Justice, an environmental law center previously based in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Ingrid's current work with the University of Iowa's uh, Biomass Fuel Project helps contribute to the university's goal of acquiring 40% of its energy from renewable sources by 2020, a project she will be discussing with us today. Ingrid, welcome. We're so happy to have you speaking today. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Sarah. Can you hear me OK? Great. Uh, I would just like to thank uh, Sarah and uh, New Bio and Penn State for uh, inviting me to speak today about our project. I think we have a really uh, great uh, program going on here at the University of Iowa with our with our biomass project, and uh, we're always excited to uh, talk to about it with uh, with anyone and everyone. So this is just a quick agenda of uh, what I'm going to speak about today. Um, we have a, an institutional sustainability goal, which was sort of the impetus for this entire project. Uh, I'll quickly talk about our utilities system and, uh, and then discuss uh, our current biomass fuel portfolio, uh, what we're currently burning, and then uh, what we have on the, uh, on the horizon. And then I'll talk quickly about uh, our uh, sustainability index uh, project that just wrapped up. Uh, so to begin with, uh, the University of Iowa, in 2010, uh, President Sally Mason of the University of Iowa um, uh, worked with the EPA, uh, EPA Region 7 to uh, commit to a number of sustainability targets. I believe there were seven uh, total sustainability targets for the University of Iowa, the second of which was to green our energy portfolio. Um, so uh, basically, the goal is to uh, obtain 40% of our energy from renewable sources by 2020. So uh, once we committed to the sustainability target, um, we, we looked at our existing uh, utilities infrastructure and, and what opportunities there are for renewable uh, energy uh, in the local area, and we decided that um, we would try to use existing assets uh, and uh, switch our fuel. So we would obtain renewable uh, fuel sources, but not uh, not have a lot of capital investments in, in new technology, but use our existing technology and change our fuel. So uh, right here um, is sort of our, our vision for how uh, this will work. And you can see in 2010, about uh, half of our energy was coming from coal. And so this is total energy. Uh, this includes electric and steam, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so out of our total uh, energy use, about half was coal. Uh, we had about a little under 20% in natural gas. Uh, we also purchase electric from our uh, local utility, uh, so we can't generate all of the electricity we need. We, we buy a, a considerable amount from our local utility as well. And then uh, in 2010, about 8% of our energy was coming from biomass. Uh, at that time, it was uh, all oat hulls, which I'll also talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, so our goal is by 2020, essentially, um, that purchased electric and natural gas stay roughly the same. And our goal is to displace uh, coal with biomass in our solid fuel boilers that uh, we already have in our main power plant. Uh, this is a quick uh, schematic of our uh, utilities operation. It's a little bit busy. It's a little bit hard to um, uh, uh, suss out sometimes. But uh, the main point is uh, that we have um, a main power plant uh, that produces steam and uh, electricity essentially uh, as a uh, byproduct of that steam production. So we co-generate uh, steam and electricity that serves, uh, that serves campus. So the steam goes for heating and cooling, uh, particularly um, uh, important for uh, maintaining 
maintaining temperatures in our in our research facilities, our laboratories, and also the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, which is here on campus. And obviously, um, there's considerable demand out, out of there, and uh, they need consider considerable reliability for their operations. Uh, this is a photo of our University of Iowa main power plant right here on the Iowa River uh, in downtown Iowa City, and it's uh, in the middle of campus. I think when it was built um, back in, I believe, the 1930s, uh, it was sort of uh, outside of campus, but now campus has grown up around it. Um, so it's down here in the middle of campus, and you can see here these two stacks are the stacks for our two solid fuel boilers. We have a stoker boiler and a circulating fluidized bed boiler. So this is another um, thing we have to consider is uh, we have two different um, boilers with two different uh, uh, designs. So there are certain types of bo uh, biomass fuels that may work better in one boiler than the other. So uh, it's a good opportunity for diversifying fuel, but can also um, pose some challenges when we're looking at using the same fuel type in both boilers. So uh, in 2010, after the university uh, set our renewable energy sustainability target, um, we put together a uh, biomass partnership uh, with uh, uh, seed grant money from the Leopold Center for Sustain uh, Sustainable Agriculture. Um, we put together uh, a group of experts in biomass. Um, they were researchers from Iowa State University, University of Iowa, University of Northern Iowa, um, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, uh, uh, John Deere, uh, Amana Forestry, and other industry partners were also involved. So uh, we got together a lot of a lot of people who are more knowledgeable than we are about biomass um, to look at what what options we have in the local area. And at the time, uh, we defined that local area as within 50 miles of Iowa City. We thought. Uh, particularly with biomass, um, transportation costs can, can really swing the economics. So we thought we, we would need to at least uh, start uh, not looking outside of 50 miles from Iowa City and see what we had in the local area. And uh, we were encouraged to find out um, that there are over uh, 20 potential fuel sources in the local area. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, uh, in, in, our, um, in our fuel shed uh, to obtain locally sourced fuels. Um, so then uh, the question became, you know, how are we going to narrow this down? We can't, uh, you know, we can't uh, go after all 20 uh, potential fuel sources at once. Um, so we've broken this down uh, primarily into uh, industrial byproducts, wood chips, and um, energy grasses uh, for, our, for our current and future biomass fuel portfolio. So, uh, Currently, for industrial byproducts, we are uh, burning oat hulls, uh, which, I, which I'll get to in the next slide. Um, other potential fuels in this category uh, include cardboard or paper sludge and um, scrap from furniture making. We have uh, Cedar Rapids and then Muscatine, Iowa uh, are both uh, within 50 miles of Iowa City and both have uh, considerable industry so that we think there's some uh, industrial byproducts from both of those communities that uh, we may be able to source fuel from. Uh, wood chips, we're currently uh, burning wood chips from a pallet remanufacturer uh, down in Muscatine, Iowa. So technically, those wood chips uh, could be considered industrial byproducts. Um, in the past, we did timber stand improvement projects with uh, the Johnson County Conservation Board. Um, they were uh, looking to um, uh, clear cut some dead and dying for trees in uh, some local parks to do prairie restoration. So we took those trees and used them for fuel uh, in, our, in our facilities. Um, uh, for, the f for future in, in the wood chip realm, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity wood. Uh, uh, emerald ash borer is starting to become more prevalent in Iowa. Um, the entire state is a quarantine zone. Uh, it's been found in several counties, although not in Johnson County uh, yet. Um, which is where Iowa City is. Uh, but that's something where uh, we're, we've been in discussions with um, state and county uh, conservation uh, organizations to look at uh, how we may be able to use Opportunity Wood from Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, there's also uh, potential for Opportunity Wood uh, with wind events or weather events um, if a lot of trees get taken out. Um, and then. Uh, on the horizon is potentially short rotation woody crops down the road. 
um, once we get, uh, hopefully, once we get our energy grasses uh, developed. And so this is the third area, and this is our current uh, focus right now for development. Um, we are uh, actively planting miscanthus as a dedicated energy crop for use as fuel uh, in our solid fuel boilers. And then also, uh, hopefully, we'll get uh, native prairie and switchgrass into the mix eventually as well. Sorry, my mouse froze there. Uh, so uh, oat hulls uh, is our uh, uh, longest running biomass fuel source. Uh, currently, we've been uh, burning them since 2000, 2003. Uh, we get them from Quaker Oats up in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which is about 25 miles away. Uh, so it's a pretty convenient source of fuel. Uh, when we started burning these, we developed a, a specially designed system to feed the oat hulls into our circulating fluidized bed boiler. And we just renewed our contract uh, for uh, oat hulls. It's a five-year contract for 40,000 tons per year. So we've uh, increased our uh, uh, oat hull usage uh, for the next five years. Uh, and this schematic, uh, the main takeaway from this schematic of the oat hull system is that um, these uh, sort of train track uh, portions are that's a mechanical conveyor and then these dotted lines are a pneumatic conveyor so uh, the old hulls move through with sort of a mechanical and then pneumatic uh, series of systems they go into our biomass silo and then from the biomass silo uh, they're pneumatically blown into the circulating fluidized bed boiler here uh, the coal is coming in down here and then they get co-fired together in our boiler that's a really reliable uh, system for uh, uh, for burning uh, this material, and uh, we we routinely burn about 50% oat hulls by heat in this boiler. We're also working with our uh, chemistry department to do uh, emissions testing uh, to determine you know what the emissions profile is uh, with uh, oat hulls versus 100% coal. And uh, uh, the preliminary report from that testing is that um, the oat hulls blended with uh, coal. Uh, had significantly better emissions profile than 100% uh, coal, particularly with uh, PAHs, which are a carcinogen, but also other um, uh, other pollutants such as SO2. Uh, so, so those are very encouraging results as far as uh, other benefits of of burning biomass. Uh, these are uh, some wood chips. Uh, these are wood chips down in our fuel yard in Muscatine County. Right now, um, uh, the oat hulls get de delivered directly to the power plant, but um, wood chips get taken to our fuel yard in Muscatine, which is also where our coal is delivered. Muscatine is right on the Mississippi River, uh, so coal comes in on a barge from there. Uh, our wood chips are delivered there. This is our uh, pile of wood chips in Muscatine. Uh, and then uh, the... Uh, Folks at the fuel yard mix uh, the wood chips and the coal together, and then we get a blended product here at the power plant, and it looks uh, like this. This is the uh, blended fuel going into the fuel silo here at our main power plant. Uh, <clears throat> so we are currently co-firing wood with coal in both, of, both our Stoker and CFB boilers at this time. Uh, we've gotten up to about 10% uh, wood chips by heat. Uh, in the Stoker and about 5% wood chips by heat uh, in the CFB. So in the CFB, we, we can uh, uh, we can get 50% uh, oat hulls by heat plus 5% wood chips by heat, and then the uh, rest is coal. So we can do th three different fuels in our CFB uh, currently at this time without too much trouble. Um, one thing with the, with the wood chips, um, size and shape are critical. So... One challenge we have looking at things like opportunity fuel, like EAB wood or other opportunity woods, is that people want to, uh, the logistics are challenging. People uh, want to just tub grind this wood and, and bring us a pile of mulch. And we've found that the um, uh, stringy pieces or long spears um, cause a lot of problems in our conveying systems. So uh, that lower picture, you can see there's sort of stringy bits and, and longer uh, pieces of wood, and those can cause sort of a rat's nest in our conveyor system, and then we have to shut the system down, and it, it causes a lot of problems. So um, the top photo, uh, that that those more uniform pieces of, of wood are really what we're looking for. 
Um, so we have a couple of uh, chippers. Our, our, our uh, pallet remanufacturer that we're currently sourcing the wood chips from now, um, they've done a good job of getting wood down to the spec. Um, but it's really important to get as, as uniform a size and shape as possible. Uh, and then moisture content is really important, bo both with uh, wood chips and with en energy grasses, as I'm going to uh, talk about in a minute. Uh, about 15% moisture is sort of the, uh, the magic number. Uh, much more than that in our boiler efficiency really goes down. Uh, one nice thing about the, the pallet wood, again, uh, is that it's already a very dry uh, product, so we've had a lot of good luck with, with that. Um, uh, the green wood that we got from our timber stand improvement projects was a little higher in moisture. Uh, it still burned okay, but not um, not quite as ideally as the already uh, really dry wood. And then uh, energy grasses, uh, giant miscanthus is uh, currently uh, the grass that we are looking at, primarily because it it's a very tall grass. Uh, it's um, nine to it can grow nine to twelve feet uh, when f fully mature. So. Uh, our amount of biomass per acre is higher with with uh, with this material than it would be with with switchgrass or prairie. Um, but uh, we've planted two pilot plots, uh, one in 2013, one in 2014, and then uh, this spring we just finished planting uh, a little over 350 350 acres uh, in Johnson and surrounding counties uh, here in Iowa, and we're looking to. Um, plant 2,500 uh, total acres over the next several years. We're working with um, Dr. Emily Heaton of Iowa State University and her lab. Um, they've done a lot of work with Miscanthus, so they um, uh, have helped us out a lot on the agronomy side of, of growing this material. We've also hired reprove, uh, Reprieve Renewables out of North Carolina. Uh, as our agricultural services provider. They uh, are experts in, in growing miscanthus as well, so they're doing all of our um, custom farming operations of miscanthus here in Iowa. Uh, and LAMPS, as you see there, is uh, Dr. Heaton's research project that stands for Long-Term uh, Assessment of Miscanthus Productivity and Sustainability. In this project, they're doing empirical studies uh, to, de to develop uh, best management practices for growing miscanthus. So, um, what particular nutrients are required, um, other inputs or, or, or um, growing techniques that, that will um, maximize yield and also uh, help hopefully environmental benefits as well. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing the results of that study. Uh, we also think there are a lot of environmental benefits uh, to be had in the local area from, uh, from planting uh, uh, perennial grasses. Um, this is a, a slide that Dr. Heaton uses in her presentation. Uh, a lot of times we present together, um, but this is sort of, if you're looking at the three uh, legs of sustainability um, and, and looking at how farmland is used in Iowa, there's about 15% of the land uh, within Iowa that isn't prop profitable in corn or soybeans, so in row crops. So this is land that they plant every year in row crops, and there's so many inputs, and the, and the soil isn't, um, for whatever reason, conducive to growing, and so it's, n it's never been profitable despite how, how much uh, money is put into it. And then uh, the environmental benefits uh, of planting perennials, um, there's research that shows that if you plant about 15% of Iowa fields into perennials, uh, you get considerable environmental benefit as far as uh, water quality improvement and erosion control. And then um, also this 15% of land uh, can provide uh, sufficient biomass uh, to meet uh, re renewable fuel standard requirements. So this uh, planting perennials can accomplish a number of environmental goals. Um, there's also been a really successful research project from Iowa State University uh, called strips, uh, and it's they're looking at planting prairie strips in in uh, farm fields, and uh, they've they've the results have shown some pretty significant uh, improvements in environmental benefits from just a, a, a small percent of fields being converted over to prairie. So uh, you get disproportionate environmental benefits from planting these perennials. And while this is prairie uh, and not miscanthus, we're thinking that. Um, uh, miscanthus would have similar, uh, maybe if not as high results, um, similar environmental benefits as far as erosion control 
um, and water quality improvements uh, because you're planting you know, uh, a perennial um, crop instead of a, a perennial grass instead of a row crop. So this is a field day we had out at our, um, these are just some photos of a field day we had out at our Miscanthus test plot. Um, this is the plot that we planted last spring in 2014. Uh, we had our field day out there in September. Uh, we had our power plant manager uh, out there as well as um, Dr. Heaton uh, and uh, um, Iowa Learning Farms, which is uh, part of Iowa State Extension, hosted our field day. Uh, we had a number of, uh, we had really good attendance. We had a number of interested growers out there as well as interested community members, uh, university, uh, university members, university officials. We had a few elected officials out there. So uh, it was a really good opportunity to, to discuss the project and have uh, potential growers and community members alike actually see uh, the miscanthus in the ground and, and ask questions uh, and you know get a look at our operation. Uh, we we learned uh, definitely a lot about growing miscanthus between our 2013 and 2014 pilot plots, which is uh, I guess why you do the why you do the uh, pilots in the first place. Um, but we uh, our uh, planter for 2013 was a, a just a modified potato planter, as is our uh, 2014 planter. But Reprieve Renewables has developed. Uh, this planter specifically for planting miscanthus, and they have a, a, a patented um, uh, process for planting rhizomes. Uh, giant miscanthus is sterile, uh, so there aren't seeds, so it, it's a little bit tricky to establish. You have to plant uh, rhizomes, and you can see these are uh, uh, vegetative pieces of the of the plant. Um, and in 2013. Uh, we didn't know a whole lot better, and they, they were they were not uniform size. Um, they were, uh, you know, they they went in sort of all different sizes. Some of them were big clumps like this. Um, Reprieve again has um, developed a system to get a more uniform size. They are cleaned off. They're ready to go uh, when they get up here. So uh, we thought our our rhizomes took uh, a lot better in 2014 than they did in 2013. And then uh, this March, we harvested both of our uh, pilot plots. Uh, we used a forage chopper. So instead of baling, we just went and uh, directly forage chopped the material. Um, so this top right material is what, is what, uh, what it looked like. Uh, this is this material coming into the, uh, coming into the tractor. So that material was stored down in Muscatine in our fuel yard. Uh, and we just got done um, with a test burn of that material. Or we're still, we're just finishing up a uh, three to four week test burn of that uh, chopped material. And uh, the, not all the results are in yet, but um, from what I uh, gathered, the test burn went really well. So we um, uh, mixed our uh, chopped noscanthus in with coal, just like we do with wood chips. And um, I haven't heard any um, problems either in the conveying system or uh, with the combustion in the boiler. So I think that's, those are very encouraging results. Um, we've also previously done a test burn of our uh, miscanthus and pellet forms. And I think this is a video over here on the right, but I'm not sure it'll play, uh, which is OK. I have some photos of the material on the next slide. But uh, we've done a test burn of miscanthus pellets, and that also went very well. Um, one advantage to pellets, um, you know, these are systems that are designed for coal. So the closer something can look and act like coal, um, the better it works in our system. So obviously des densified material uh, worked swimmingly in our, in, our, uh, in our conveying systems. There was a little bit of dust, but really um, not too much in the way of concerns with, uh, with, uh, with the pelletized material. And then we've also tested warm season prairie grasses. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, again, like wood chips, uh, size and shape are important. So uh, the more uniform the material is, the better it works in our system. Uh, and then uh, moisture content, again, below 15% is, is pretty important. Um, so these are some results from our pellet trial burn that we did uh, last year. Um, uh, these are, again, photos of the, the blended material. Uh, that top left photo is blended material going into our um, fuel silo, 
and then uh, the lower picture is the blended material going through our conveying systems um, and and the results of this uh, test burn uh, uh, were really positive. Uh, ground prairie grass. Uh, this test burn was a little bit more challenging. Uh, we had a, a, a grower down south of Iowa City who had uh, several fields of uh, prairie grass that he wanted um, taken, off, taken off his field. He, he talked to us and we, we wanted to take them for a test burn. Uh, he um, harvested the field and baled uh, the material and then while the bales were waiting for us in the field, the field flooded. So uh, by the time we got uh, to processing the material, it was very, very wet. Uh, so when it went through the grinder, it didn't grind um, to the specification that we wanted. And we were trying to um, uh, load this material through the oat hull system, which I showed earlier. So it requires a lot of pneumatic conveying. And because uh, the material was so wet and didn't grind to the proper specification, it didn't flow through the pneumatic system properly. Um, so we had some, some problems there. But we think uh, we've learned through this system, you know, essentially what not to do. I don't think it, it, it shows that we, um, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that we couldn't get the grass through the oat hull system. But we would just need to make sure that size was, was appropriate. And now with our new oat hull contract, we have uh, sufficient oat hull supply uh, that we think we're fully, we're going to fully use that oat hull system for oat hulls. And we may not put grass through there, but our current uh, chopped miscanthus test uh, is pretty encouraging for just mixing grass directly with coal and uh, combusting it that way. Um, so we definitely have multiple options for uh, successfully combusting this material in the boiler. I'm also going to quickly talk about our energy sustainability index. Um, so like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we had uh, about um, 20 different potential biomass fuel sources, and there's a lot of considerations that go into, you know, what what uh, biomass fuels are are, are we going to focus on? Uh, what's in what's important to us as as far as that decision? And we wanted a tool um, that would give us some better or more objective uh, measures of things that were important to us. So. Um, we wanted to look at our fuel choices from uh, a holistic and sustainability point of view and not just a bottom line economic uh, point of view. Economics are important, but we think there's other considerations to be made. Um, like with miscanthus and the other uh, environmental benefits uh, and, that come with that and, and you know, uh, local fuel uh, opportunities, um, we think there's a lot of uh, opportunities with biomass beyond just the uh, bottom line price. So we uh, got a grant from the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture in 2013 to put together a um, tool, a sustainability index for evaluating uh, vari various uh, biomass fuel sources. Um, and that, that project uh, just wrapped up last month. So we're, we're, uh, we'll be getting uh, that information out on our website soon with our results and, and we we were able to create a framework um, index for for making sustainable biomass uh, fuel choices. But uh, one important thing to consider um, when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at fuel procurement from the University of Iowa side is that you know Iowa doesn't have any natural gas or coal resources in state. So whenever we buy fossil fuels, where that money is going out of state for fuel purchases. Um, but we are good at growing things here in Iowa. So uh, when we look at um, growing miscanthus or um, you know growing uh, short rotation woody crops or um, sourcing industrial byproducts from, from local industry, that's money that um, stays in state. And that's money that uh, helps support uh, farmers who might be looking for other uh, sources of revenue besides just the um, corn and soybean rotation. Um, so we think that there's a lot of lot of opportunities uh, with biomass here, uh, and for collaboration with with um, the local community and other local entities. So that's um, pretty much all I had prepared. Uh, Slide-wise, I know it's a lot of information. There's a lot of moving parts to this project, um, but uh, you know, I think our, our results with uh, miscanthus and with other fuels have shown that there's a lot of opportunity in the biomass area. And one 
one of our um, main objectives here at the University of Iowa is to have a diverse fuel portfolio. So um, we're not looking for just one fuel source to, to get us to our 2020 goal or even to get us to our entire um, you know, energy output requirement. Um, we think that having a diverse set of fuels that we can rely on um, provides us with a lot of flexibility, it mitigates risks, and um, you know, it, it, it provides a lot of opportunity for a lot of exciting projects. So um, with that, I will open it up to any questions related to our biomass project. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Uh, if you have questions, please type them into the chat pod. We have lots of time uh, for questions today. Uh, first question. Did you have any problems with losses of chopped miscanthus fuel during storage or transport? Um, so storage and transport are, are two of the diff most difficult logistical problems to solve, especially when it comes to low density material. Right, sure. So uh, I think we did note um, uh, while our chopped material was being stored uh, in the fuel yard, we had it tarped. Uh, but I think there was some wind loss. So. Uh, that's something we're looking at. Um, we're looking at building uh, a little bit, uh, at least some uh, uh, walls to go around our, our, you know, the fuel yard is not very high tech. There's just, you know, piles of material out there. So we're um, looking at putting a structure out there that will at least hopefully um, keep that material from, from uh, blowing around while it's sitting in the pile. But um, when it's being transferred in the trucks, that's something that we're, we're looking at and how to make that um, that go more smoothly because I think there was some wind loss there as well. So, uh, so it sounds like um, some of most of what you've done so far are just kind of test uh, test processes and test burns. Uh, but as you look ahead to considering larger larger scale operation and and maybe more of more of one feedstock if you like that or your twenty five hundred acres of miscanthus, um, it, you know it becomes a uh, important to consider how you set up the contracts. So uh, mm -hmm. Dan asks if your suppliers prefer multi-year contracts or year to year, or how much control do you have over, over how to dictate uh, procurement? Sure, so I think our preference would be longer term contracts. Like I said, our old hole contract is five years. I think our contract with uh, our wood chip supplier is also five years. Uh, and our land leases for uh, our miscanthus are currently 10 years. Um, so we're, we're, we're definitely trying, uh, particularly with miscanthus, since there's a three-year um, sort of establishment period, or, or at least three years until the, the field is mature, um, we needed the contracts to be at least 10 years so that we would uh, sort of recoup, we would be able to recoup some of that initial investment um, since you don't, you don't see as much uh, material until year three. Um, the first year you uh, usually don't harvest. The second year you get about a third of, of the total biomass you would get uh, at maturity. And then by year three onward, uh, you get a full stand maturity for about. And the, the typical stand uh, um, age can be 15 to 20 years. So uh, those contracts also include um, options for five-year renewals, I think two five-year renewals. For, um, for the oat hulls and the and wood chips, so the things that you have experience uh, buying at a larger scale already, <clears throat> how, how does the uh, delivery process for those square up with your demand? So do you get those only when uh, seasonally when you need them? Um, do they come every month or do you get a single delivery for the season or do they come when they're available and then you're responsible for storing them in the meantime? Yeah, uh, the I'm trying to think when we just renegotiated the, the old hulls. So the old hulls come uh, more or less just in time. So uh, we have a small biomass uh, fuel silo uh, for storage there. Um, and I'm sorry, the detail is escaping me um, right now as, as to how we have um, the new contract sorted out. But that was one thing we were concerned about, is that we wanted to have um, a steady supply of oat holes, but not so much that we couldn't 
uh, store them. So I think we get uh, oat hull deliveries during the week, um, but not on the weekend. Uh, but we get oat hull deliveries pretty much year round. So that's not a seasonal, that's sort of a continuous supply. And that was something uh, we worked out in this new contract is to have a more consistent supply. It used to be that we would get um, oat hulls uh, more or less when they were available. And that caused, you know, uh, some potential um, operational complications, but we have that more or less um, sorted out at this point. And with wood chips, it's a little easier because they uh, can be stored down in our, our fuel yard and, and mixed um, with the coal down there so we don't have um, as much in the way of storage constraints. And then in that contract, in our contract with our fuel yard supplier, we have a, a, a specification for a certain amount of blend. Um, so that all got more or less sorted out in that contract. Okay. Um, Dan brings up another question. Um, so a lot of universities, when they look at diversifying their portfolio and, and increasing the percent renewable energy, will go for something like buying offset credits for, for wind energy somewhere else in the country, for example, or, or, or somewhere nearby even, if they're lucky. Um, so, you know, your institution went another way, uh, looking at the proportion of coal it used and, and looked at directly replacing that with biomass. So what was the driver for deciding on the, the biomass replacing coal route rather than doing something else like these wind energy credits, for example. Sure, so I think uh, part of the reason we're going um, in the biomass direction, and I think it, uh, wind ener energy credits are also something we've discussed, so they, that might uh, come into play uh, as far as our um, renewable energy target down the road. Uh, we haven't ruled those out by any means, um, but part of the reason we've gone in the direction of uh, biomass is that we still need to provide uh, steam to campus. So um, uh, we thought that the, the, the best way to do that um, would be to, to replace, um, we still had the issue of we need to, to re replace fossil fuels in our existing um, energy production infrastructure uh, because we still need to produce that energy on site. So uh, we needed a renewable source of on-site uh, energy to uh, get steam to, to our campus customers. So the, the test burns uh, that you've done with Miscanthus, you said you had one, one that was just the, the chopped from the forage harvesting chopping um, material and then one that was pelletized material. Did you pelletize that uh, in-house at the university or did you purchase a pelletized material and then in future, if, if you decide to go with a pelletized route, would that be something that would become part of your logistical process for, for handling, or would you try to um, outsource that? Sure, so uh, yeah, so, so like I said in the presentation, we really liked the pelletized material. It worked really well uh, in our system. Uh, we did not pelletize it ourselves, so we um, worked with a uh, a pelletizer in Omaha, Nebraska, which is about uh, four hours away. Um, so that uh, was good just from a from a test burn uh, standpoint, but obviously that's not a workable solution uh, long term economically uh, because getting the material in the local area and then shipping it all the way over to Nebraska and then bringing it back um, j just doesn't make sense for a number of different reasons. Um, we have looked at um, what opportunities there are in our local area as far as um, pelletizing or, or uh, other, you know, cubing, briquetting, torrefaction. Um, there is some availability in the local area. There's not a lot, and there's not a lot that's um, very economically competitive. So um, it's something we're still looking at investigating. It's something we can hope, we, we hope down the road uh, we can you know, mix into this process without it being um, cost prohibitive. But at this point, um, there's not a lot of opportunity locally for pelletizing. And I think the second part of your question was uh, how we would uh, mix that into our into our uh, logistics. Was that yeah? Your question? Um, if you, if you decide to go with a pelletized miscanthus. Uh, material as your sort of primary, uh, as your go-to biomass option, um, would you try to 
become masters in, in paladizing <laughs> yourselves? Or would you um, try to leverage, e even though you said they're limited, one of the opportunities in your area? Yeah, so I think the goal would be to leverage um, other opportunities in our in our area. We've actually talked to the Iowa um, uh, Department of Economic Development about, you know, could we, um, is there any opportunity to uh, attract, you know, a pellet, uh, a pellet mill um, to Iowa? Uh, I think we would probably need um, more customers than just the University of Iowa, but there are other small institutional boilers that might be interested in this type of material um, around the area. Uh, so, so I think that the goal would be um, to outsource that. I don't think we have the internal capability to, to take that on at this point. Okay. Um, clearly, one of the advantages of a pellet is automatic uniform uh, nature of the material in terms of size and moisture content um, and, you know, density and, and feedability um, shape and everything like that. So uh, you, you had mentioned that, you know, you had had some back and forth with your uh, wood chip supplier about what exactly, th the kind of fuel spec that would work the best for you. Um, in a lot of cases, I think when, when an institution is procuring wood chips for, for a boiler system, it's kind of up to them in their own contract to build in uh, specs and, and, and communicate what their needs are. Did you develop any kind of sort of official fuel specification that you think could be translated to, to other applications, to other institutions um, that could be used more broadly? I guess what are the, what are the big, if so, what are the, the main bullet points that you included in your specifications? Sure, so I wouldn't say that we have, um, and this is something that's on our, uh, you know, on our to-do list more or less, um, you know, our, our power plant operations staff, um, when we're looking at new material, uh, goes out and looks at the material and they have a good idea of what they're looking for, so, um, you know, we don't have it, uh, we don't have the spec um, memorialized, um, you know, in an official you know, document. Um, we, so that's something that would need to happen um, uh, if we go out, uh, for instance, if we do a, an RFP for wood material um, and, and open that back up, uh, you know, that's something we need to put. But the highlights, um, I think, are, are basically um, the, the size and shape and the moisture content. Uh, and then, um, you know how how you know what are the what are the logistics as well of, of getting that material? But I think um, moisture content below fifteen percent, and then um, what is, what is the size and, and shape? And I think uh, one inch minus is sort of what we're looking for there. Yeah, it seemed like uh, from what you said, it's just those really long pieces that kind of get caught up in your system. Right. Okay. Yep. So. Um, with, with your background in law, uh, maybe you can you can speak to this a little bit. Did you run into any really sticky regulatory issues with getting this going? And then I guess as a second part of that question, do you think that the the whole endeavor to do this would have been um, a lot more difficult if you were working in the private industry rather than uh, for a university? Um, so so uh, actually, the first part of your question, no, we didn't. We didn't uh, have too many uh, problems. You know, both of our solid fuel boilers um, have construction permits. Um, they're also both part of our Title V operating permit, so they have um, emission limits and certain fuel uh, requirements. Um, we have um, we're permitted to we're obviously permitted to burn all of the materials that we're we're burning. Um, we worked with uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resources. We got them. Um, fuel analyses and, and, and samples and other things, so they, they had a good idea of what the um, emissions profile on these items would be. And then we, um, uh, uh, our permits, um, every time we go over a certain percentage by heat, we need to um, stack test again to make sure um, the emissions profile is staying within within limits. But, um, you know, none of that process has been particularly onerous. And I can't, you know, I, I can't really speak too much to what the challenges would be uh, in industry versus uh, the university setting. Uh, I know that industries also set um, sustainability targets. 
um, and we, you know, um, industries have bottom lines to protect, but we also have, you know, we're stewards of um, state funding, so um, we all, you know, we don't have uh, unlimited budgets by any means. So I'm not, um, you know, I, I think it would depend um, just on um, more or less on institutional commitment to sustainability more than anything else. Um, you know, if, if I think a private industry um, uh, firm was was committed to, you know, had a similar sustainability target and wanted to go in the direction of biomass, I think, um, you know, they would definitely figure it out. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to suggest that, you know, universities <laughs> have money to, to just throw around, but um, right. I guess what I, what I was getting at was that there's sort of inherent value added for uh, education and outreach purposes uh, associated with, with this because it's part of a, a university system, but... Um, yep, yeah, abso absolutely. And I think that there have been a lot of really good opportunities for, for collaboration with researchers, both at, at University of Iowa and Iowa State uh, and other partnerships with other organizations that, that might be easier since we're a state agency. You know, nothing we have is proprietary. Um, you know, we, we're, we're already a, an open records place, so, um, you know, it does make it easier and 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 I think there are opportunities you know one of our um, our, our missions as, as the university is to you know be on the forefront of these types of things so um, I think this type of project only definitely lends itself to that um, uh, the core mission of our institution yeah and it's interesting I mean I think it's notable um, to, to mention that you, you've had no no problem with stack tests and uh, it, you know, it seems like this has been a pretty seamless integration up to a certain percentage so far. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, can you can you describe again, and, and maybe you already went over this, but just to refresh, um, sort of the trajectory of incorporation of biomass into your system? So, it seems like most of your tests are run at about ten percent. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do you expect what is sort of the the peak percentage for co-firing that you are working toward? Um, and sort of where did you where did you start, and can you describe that trajectory and how what you expect to happen as you approach that goal? Sure. So I think I think our goal is uh, uh, as high as we can get. Um, you know, the five to ten percent range has been sort of where where we're comfortable starting out. Uh, you know, making sure there's not uh, too much of an issue. Um, and that five percent, five to ten percent by heat range, um, you know, ends up being with undensified material ends up being a pretty high um, percentage of volume in the boiler. So um, five percent by heat might be, um, you know, uh, fifty percent by volume or more of of undensified material, just because the the BTU content of a of a wood chip or a a piece of chopped miscanthus is going to be considerably less than coal. Um, but I think our, our idea has been to start, um, you know, at, at those lower percentages and, and, and make sure everything is, is working right and then um, go up, you know, in um, two and a half to five percent by heat increments. Um, so that's sort of how this, this uh, chopped muscant, this test burn that's just wrapping up, uh, we started, I think, at under two percent by heat and we've been going up uh, in, you know, Two and a half percent by heat increments um, over the last uh, several weeks, and and trying to find uh, basically with the idea of we would slowly ramp it up and 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 see where we hit a limit. Uh, and so far, we haven't um, uh, we haven't had a, a problem that would suggest that we can't keep going higher. Um, I think once you once you get to considerably more. Uh, a, a volume such that you're considerably more by heat, um, the entire um, uh, amount of BTUs that you're getting will decrease because if you're if you have more undensified material percentage by heat, uh, your overall BTUs is going to go down somewhat. So um, that's a consideration uh, going forward: is can we still meet our load demands if we have fewer BTUs total in the boiler? That's another reason why. Uh, densification, even though it's expensive, is still on the table uh, because there's going to be a point at which we we can't, you know, physically get enough material in the boiler to get to the to the BT lo BTU load that we need. Um, but yeah, so far, I mean, I think we're just um, 
trying to ramp up until we until we find a problem. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the physical difficulty of moving stuff into the boiler. So, so I know that some people have cited uh, issues with grass, uh, grass-based biomass, and, and maybe even something like oat hulls, of it being kind of like a fluffy material that's that's hard to move efficiently mm. um, in a boiler stream. So, do you think that the pre-mixing it with coal kind of helps? I guess, for lack of a better term, complex it in a way that that it's much easier to move than if it were on its own. Yeah, I think we're definitely we're seeing that um, with the material. I think, um, uh, especially if the biomass material comes in very dry, you know, um, the coal uh, just sits out, you know, in in the, in the fuel yard, and sometimes it can have like a, a decent amount of moisture to it. But I think when we add in dry dry biomass to the the coal material, it's it it seems to be sort of um, yeah, I think how you put it, you know, it's, it sticks, it, it seems to stick together fairly well, so the, the biomass doesn't um, tend to fly around or create as much dust. In fact, um, we found uh, in this last test burn um, that our, uh, our coal handling system, uh, the biomass actually seems to pick a lot of that material up, and so it, it, it almost cleans the system. So before when op our operations staff were, were spending a couple hours a day cleaning out that, that coal handling system with the, with the biomass mixture, now uh, it, it takes 10 to 15 minutes. So I think there's some, some hidden benefits to, to mixing these materials together that we weren't yeah. anticipating. To, to quantify that uh, labor cost, or, or right. at least... Uh, Headache cost. <laughs> yeah, and amount of water as well mm -hmm. um, that we're saving. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're running up against 2 o'clock. If there are any last-minute questions, uh, please type them in now. In the meantime, uh, I just want to thank you uh, very much for going over all of uh, all of the system. And this is certainly really interesting. It's nice to see practical examples uh, of these kinds of systems. Uh, and I will try to be following it very closely. Uh, our One of our sister projects, uh, SENUSA Bioenergy, is associated with uh, the STRIPS project that you mentioned. So oh, sure. hopefully we can uh, try to you know, keep an eye on, on what's, what's going on uh, at the University of Iowa and uh, stay tuned. So thank you again uh, very much for your discussion. Is there anything you wanted to, any thoughts you wanted to leave us with today? Uh, you, you know, I, I just wanted to thank you again for uh, letting me uh, uh, present about our project, and I think um, it's really exciting, and I, I hope that, uh, you know, we, we frequently feel like we're sort of out on the, on the bleeding edge of this project, and w which, is, uh, which is good, but I think, you know, it would be nice to see other institutions or other, um, you know, industry leaders coming on, on board with this type of project. It, because uh, I think there are a lot of a lot of benefits that can be had for uh, looking into biomass more seriously.